My name is Kevin Shar. I'm the vice president of the QCGN and a constitutional lawyer by trade. I spent 10 years as legal counsel to the Commissioner of Official Languages. My boss at the time just happens to be this evening's guest, Mr. Graham Frazier. This webinar series is delivered in two phases. Phase one will lay a foundational understanding of language rights. On March 11th, this afternoon's moderator, Marion Sandelands, covered the history of language rights in Canada. Today, Mr. Fraser will talk about the Official Languages Act, and coming up on April 8th, we will look at the Charter of the French Language. Phase two of the series, which will begin on April 22nd, We'll look at English speaking Quebec's experience with these rights and we'll discuss where we are going in the future. If you have any questions for Mr. Fraser during the webinar, you are invited to submit them through the moderator via the chat function. We'll do our best to answer your questions within the time allotted or follow up with a response. Now the purpose of this afternoon's presentation is to leave you with an understanding of three things. First, the importance of the Official Language Act to English-speaking Quebecers. This act applies to all federal institutions that provide services to our community, and it is the basis of the federal funding many of our community organizations receive from the Government of Canada. Second, the Official Languages Act breathes life into rights that are guaranteed by the constitutions, the Constitution, rights that belong to every speaking Quebecer. And third, that these rights require community effort to protect. If you have any questions about the webinar series, or if you have topics, suggestions, and recommendations, please contact Stephen Thompson, QCGN Director, Government Relations, Policy and Research. His email is in the chat. I'll now turn the reins over to Marion. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This afternoon's webinar topic, as you know, is Canada's Official Languages Act. And we are very lucky today to have Mr. Graham Fraser, former Commissioner of Official Languages, to talk to us about this quasi-constitutional piece of federal legislation. Graham Fraser, OC, was Canada's sixth Commissioner of Official Languages, a journalist and writer. He's the author of several books, including in English and French, including Sorry, I Don't Speak French, Confronting the Canadian Crisis That Won't Go Away, which is a must read. I have my own library copy sitting on my bedside table. It's excellent. Uh, Mr. Fraser is also currently working on a book about uh, Frank Scott, a great English speaking Quebecer, poet, intellectual and constitutional expert who was also a member of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome you, Mr. Fraser, and over to you. Thank you. Um, to begin with, I'd like to thank the QCGN for inviting me to talk to you about the Official Languages Act um, and say what a high bar uh, Marin Sandelan set with her first um, presentation on language rights. It's available on YouTube, and I would urge anybody who missed it to, to look it up. Um, as uh, Kevin has just said, we worked together at the Office of the Commissioner of Official Languages for almost 10 years. So if I get any hard questions, I will refer them to either Marion or uh, Kevin. Um, Andrew Pellucci and Kelsey Craig organized the slides, which I never could have done. Even though it involves a little bit of an overlap, um, I thought it would be useful to start with uh, what happened in 1962 when this the story really begins. Um, uh, it, the FLQ was setting off bombs. It was a period of significant language tension. And in January, André Lando, who was the uh, editor in chief of Le Devoir, called for the creation of a Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. Um, that was dismissed out of hand by then Prime Minister John Diefenbaker. The Diefenbaker government lost its majority in the spring. Um, the Liberals did not succeed in forming even a minority government, in large part because of the election of 26 Quebec members of social credit, the 26 creditists, largely unilingual members from small town Quebec 
who raised the language issue literally every day in the House of Commons. Why was it that the orders of the day were in English only? Why was it that uh, uh, the menu in the parliamentary restaurant was in English only? Why was it that the announcements at the station and at the airport were in English only? Why was it that the, the security guards could, not, could only greet visitors in English and couldn't greet their constituents? In December, Lester Pearson, opposition leader, leader of the Liberal Party, um, promised that if he were elected prime minister, he would create a royal commission. Um, and uh, in April 1963, he was elected head of a minority government. And that election night, uh, his senior advisor, um, Maurice Lamontagne, crossed paths with uh, uh, Andre Lando and said, we've got to talk, you know about what? Well, it was the creation of a Royal Commission. And after some reluctance, Lando agreed to become co-chair of the Royal Commission with the president of uh, Carleton University, Davidson Dunton. Um, as Marion said, um, perhaps the most memorable line of the preliminary report that they produced in 1965 was one saying that without fully realizing it, Canada was passing through the greatest crisis in its history. In 1966, Lester Pearson, who thought the tone of the preliminary report was exactly right, uh, made a speech in the House of Commons in which he said that the government hopes and expects that within a reasonable period of time, the public service would be in a position that it will be normal practice for oral or written communications within the public service to be made in either official language at the option of the persons making them in the knowledge they will be understood by those directly concerned. Communications with the public will normally be made in either official language with regard to the person being served the linguistic and cultural values of both English speaking and French speaking Canadians will be reflected through civil service recruitment and training. And interestingly enough, a climate will be created in which public servants from both language groups will work together toward common goals using their own language and applying their respective cultural values, but each fully appreciating and understanding those of the other. I've always thought that that was, if you like, the I have a dream speech about language policy in Canada. Often people say that Pierre Trudeau had a dream of bilingualism. In many cases, it was, I think, I think it was actually Lester Pearson. A year later, in the fall of 1967, Pierre Trudeau, who was then Minister of Justice, gave a speech outlining his plans for a Charter of Rights in which he said that language rights were twofold, the right to use and the right to learn. Those two statements by Pearson in 1966 and by Trudeau in 1967, both made before the first volume of the Royal Commission's report was published, set the basic framework for language policy. And that framework has remained in place ever since. Later in 1967, the Royal Commission published its recommendations. The first recommendation was that English and French be formally declared the official languages of the Parliament of Canada, of the federal courts, of the federal government, and of the federal administration. The commissioners also recommended that New Brunswick and Ontario be declare English and French as official languages, and that a system of bilingual districts be created. That didn't happen. Uh, Ontario did not, and although it did create a system of districts where services would be provided in English and French, the proposal for bilingual districts was abandoned by the federal government. What was adopted a year and a half after the recommendation was an Official Languages Act, and six months after that, the appointment of a Commissioner of Official Languages. The Commissioner of Official Languages, the commissioners wrote in Canada, should play a dual role. In the first place, he will be the active conscience, actually the protector of the Canadian public where official languages are concerned. 
It, his duty will be to examine particular cases in which the federal authorities have failed to respect the rights and the privileges of individuals or groups of Canadians. The commissioner will in a sense play the role of a federal linguistic ombudsman by receiving and bringing to light the grievance of any residents concerning the official languages. The commissioners then became quite specific. The commissioner should have wide powers of inquiry, the ability to question under oath, a sizable staff, a renewable seven year term, be dismissible only on petition of both houses of parliament and be accountable to parliament to which he would report annually. I quote, he would have high moral authority through his influence on the Canadian public and the government and parliament of Canada and could well become one of Canada's most effective instruments making for equality of the two official languages. That all happened and Keith Spicer became the first commissioner of official languages in the spring of 1970. In a postscript, the commissioners spelled out the nature of their focus on linguistic minorities. <clears throat> Majorities generally can and do assert their interests and defend themselves, and governments have to listen to them. Minorities are always liable to be overlooked, even in a regime of equality. The minority needs legal protection. Fair play demands it. But that is not all. The impossibility of living a full life in French outside Quebec, and even in certain parts of Quebec, is certainly one cause of the present crisis in Canada. Living in French must be made possible in every part of Canada where there are enough French speaking people. Linguistic equality will exist in Canada only if Francophones are treated in other provinces as Anglophones now are in Quebec. Then the commissioners ended with the indication that they would be examining the principal institutions of the country in terms of the two languages and dominant cultures. It is in these institutions, they wrote, at work, at school, at work, in every situation where there is communication between people that the future of English and French is to be decided. In fact, it would be more accurate to speak of the future of French language and culture, for English is in a position of strength in North America. French language and culture will flourish in Canada to the extent that conditions permit them to be truly present and creative. Armed with that definition and the 1969 Official Languages Act, Keith Spicer undertook the job of Commissioner of Official Languages with verve and enthusiasm. For people of a certain age, I think he is still the only Commissioner of Official Languages whose name is remembered. Spicer insisted, as he put it in his memoir, that unless we made French stronger and more secure in Quebec, French elsewhere was doomed. In his annual report published in the fall of 1971, he wrote, the long-term future of French in North America will depend mainly on Quebec's ability to strengthen its principal language of culture as a language of work and general social use. In the end, the vitality of French everywhere in Canada will rest on the dynamism, indeed the healthy predominance of French in this unique jurisdiction where Francophones form a majority and possess institutions reflecting this reality. Aside from his cheerful provocations, like suggesting that federal public servants should uh, uh, learn or improve their French by going to body rub parlors across the river in Hull, Spicer did a number of significant things. In his phrase, he bluffed into existence the whole idea of the right to work in French as well as in English in the federal public service. This did not actually become part of the Official Languages Act until 1988, almost 20 years after the first version. But another stand that Spicer took was a very cautious one. During the Jean Delain crisis in the summer of 1976, when air traffic controllers went on strike to protest the use of French in ground to air communications, Spicer refused to jump to conclusions, saying he would rather land safely in a unilingual aircraft than crash in a bilingual one. A lengthy inquiry then found that in fact, having Francophone pilots communicate with bil bilingual air traffic controllers was actually safer than forcing them to both to work in their second language. Max Yalden, who was Keith Spicer's successor, was very aware that he would be perceived as a gray bureaucrat throwing a wet blanket over the commissioner's activist role. 
On the contrary, he was rigorous and outspoken, dealing with the media almost daily. One of the first questions he was asked was about Bill 101, which had just been passed. Well, I said, he recalled in his memoir, it seemed to me that no one, least of all me, liked restrictive language legislation. I'd even heard it said that Premier Levesque found it humiliating. But I also thought that Les Anglais had not been very obliging of their own accord about giving French an appropriate status. And perhaps in the circumstances, there was a little choice but to go the legislative route. His, success, his successor, Dibéville Fortier, was criticized in a unanimous vote in the Quebec National Assembly for writing in his 1988 annual report that English-speaking Quebecers had been humiliated. Fortier also threatened to quit if the Mulroney government did not table a revised version of the Official Languages Act to bring it into conformity with the new uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Whether that was a factor or not, I don't know, but Brian Mulroney brought forward Bill C-72. It was a shock to English-speaking Tory MPs who had, from rural constituencies who had assumed that the new legislation would roll back some of the term requirements of bilingualism. Instead, it was a complete rewriting of the act, which moved forward, not backward. Let me run through it briefly. The preamble of the act sets out the principles of the legislation, that English and French are Canada's official languages and had equality of status and equal rights and privileges as to their use in all institutions of the parliament and the government of Canada. And that the constitution provides for full and equal access to parliament, to the laws of Canada and to courts established by parliament in both official languages. It also stressed that the Constitution established guarantees relating to the right of any member of the public to communicate with any institution of Parliament or the government in either official language. Interestingly, the preamble also said that employees of the Parliament and the Government of Canada, quote, should have equal opportunities to use the official language of their choice while working together in pursuing the goals of those institutions. That phrase, working to, while working together, was interpreted to put an end to the idea of French language units inside the federal government, which had been one of the proposals discussed. The rest of the preamble spoke of the goal of full participation of English-speaking and French-speaking Canadians in the public service, enhancing the vitality and supporting the de development of minority language communities, and enhancing the bilingual character of the national capital region. These set the aspirational goals of the Official Languages Act, much as Pearson had done decades earlier in 1966. Then part one of the act established the abuse of both parliament, languages in parliament with simultaneous interpretation and translation in the records of debates. Part two applied to legislation and made it clear that all the documents produced by parliament, and there's a significant list, shall be made, enacted, printed, published, or tabled simultaneously in both languages, and both language versions are equally authoritative. That was supposed to put an end to the phrase French to follow, the French to follow. Part three concerned the administration of justice and specified that every federal court has the duty to ensure that any person giving evidence may be heard in the official language of their choice. The most interesting element of part three is section 16.1, which states that every federal court other than the Supreme Court of Canada has the duty to ensure that if one or the other official languages are chosen for proceedings, I quote, every judge or officer who hears those proceedings is able to understand the language chosen without the assistance of an interpreter. The exemption of the Supreme Court was granted because the consort court consists of only nine judges who by tradition in some cases and by law for Quebec's three judges represented different regions of the country. Then Justice Minister Raymond Natitian told a parliamentary committee that the time was not yet right. There was not a large enough pool of bilingual candidates for the Supreme Court in parts of the country. That was over 30 years ago. In the white paper, English and French towards a substantive equality of official languages in Canada that Minister Melanie Joly 
released last month, she recommends the following. I quote, remove the exception relative to the Supreme Court from section 16 of the act. The government will take into account the case law and the composition and eligibility criteria of the Supreme Court in developing this proposed legislative amendment. That last sentence is a reference to the Nadon decision in 2014, or more formally, the reference re Supreme Court Act sections five and six, which held that supernumerary federal court judge Mark Nadon could not be named to the Supreme Court because as a federal court judge, he did not meet the criteria. This some argue means that no changes can be made to the Supreme Court appointment process. I would argue that deleting an exception for the Supreme Court that was not contemplated as permanent does not represent a breach of the Supreme Court Act. The Prime Minister has been acting in the spirit of that change by naming only bilingual judges to the Supreme Court. Part seven of the act is perhaps the most interesting and the only part to be amended since 1988. It commits the government to enhancing the vitality of the English and French minority language communities. In 2005, this became a binding obligation. This was one of the major accomplishments of my predecessor, Diana Dunn. However, part seven was tested in the courts recently in the case of Fédération des Francophones de la Colombie-Britannique versus Canada Employment and Social Development. Federal court judge Denis Gascon revealed the flaws in the act. The Fédération argued the Federal Department and the Employment Insurance Commission failed to meet their obligations to the Francophone minority in the agreement transferring responsibilities to the province, in this case, British Columbia. The decision is under appeal, but it's <clears throat> worth noting Judge Gascon's exhaustively detailed analysis, 105 pages in English, 146 in French. After describing some of the more definitive obligations in the act, he cited the language used in part seven. The decision is under appeal, but bear with me while I quote paragraph 213 of his decision. When in the same act, Parliament uses the word measures, sometimes with the article les in the French text, sometimes with the qualifiers possible, appropriate, or necessary, sometimes with the adjective all, one cannot ignore the fact that in some section 41.2, Parliament was content to speak of positive measures to be taken by federal institutions with the indefinite article des and the qualifier positive in the French text without providing further clarification or restrictions. Parliament does not say necessary measures. It does not say appropriate measures. It does not say all possible measures. Clearly, the text of the act reveals that the expression positive measures does not mean the same thing as these other types of measures. It clearly does not have the same attributes of comprehensiveness, necessity, precision, or sufficiency found elsewhere in the OLA. I will not go through all of Judge Gascon's extremely detailed arguments, except to note that in paragraph 216, he states flatly that in short, section 41 does not impose specific and particular duties on federal institutions. And in his conclusion in paragraph 293, he states that the scope of the duty contained in section 41 is hamstrung by the absence of regulation and the remedies sought by the FFCB are not supported in the current act as drafted, structured and implemented. He doesn't quite say that part seven isn't worth the paper it's written on, but it's a close run thing. So in her white paper, Minister Jolie responds, in 2018, in one of its decisions, the federal court highlighted the need to clarify through regulations, the obligations of federal institutions to take positive measures. New regulations under part seven of the act would be one way to have federal institutions take positive measures and thus improve the realization of the government's commitment to official language minority communities and the promotion of English and French. The regulations would set out the terms and conditions for the implementation of part seven, particularly with regard to consultation with stakeholders and accountability of federal institutions. 
While the act already provides for the possibility of adopting regulations, it does not yet include the possibility of enacting binding policy instruments to support the implementation of positive measures by federal institutions. The government confirms its intention to clarify this point, to protect what's been achieved, and to enact binding policy instruments concerning positive measures. So we'll have to wait to see what the, the binding policy instruments concerning positive measures actually are. Part A to the Act goes into detail of the responsibilities of Treasury Board, which I won't go into here. Part 9 describes the role of the Commissioner of Official Languages, and in the explanatory notes in the annotated version produced by Treasury Board in 2001, the role is defined as promotion, facilitation of, facilitation of understanding between the two official language groups, monitoring, investigating, reporting, auditing, and court intervention. Deanna Dawn was always able to rattle those off. I somehow never really managed to, and I added them down to two, promotion and protection, because those di different elements I felt fell into those two categories. Part 10 lays out the court remedies. The abilities of complainants to appeal to federal court if they are unhappy with the commissioner's decision, and the ability of the commissioner to take a case to federal court on behalf of a complainant. For example, when I was commissioner, we did that in the case of the Radio Canada decision to dramatically cut programming in Windsor. So where are we now? As part of the 50th anniversary of the acts, uh, Minister Jolie held consultation sessions across the country. The official languages committees of both the House and the Senate held hearings. Raymond Teberge, the commissioner of official languages, made a detailed set of recommendations. And last month, the white paper, English and French, towards a substantive equality of official languages in Canada was published. It calls for strengthening the act in a number of ways. But the aspect that may have the most impact on the English community in Quebec is the extension of obligations to federally regulated businesses. Again, bear with me. I'm going to quote it, the document at some length. It lays out the following goals. Specify a power to encourage federally regulated private businesses to promote the equal status of the official languages in order to increase the use of French, active offer, as a language of service and work everywhere in the country. As concerns federally regulated private businesses, give workers the right to carry out their activities in French and federally regulated private businesses established in Quebec and in other regions with a strong francophone presence in the country, oblige the employer to communicate with its employees in French in federally regulated private businesses established in Quebec and in other regions with a strong francophone presence in the country. The employer may communicate with its employees in both official languages as long as the use of French is at least equivalent to the use of English. This is the basic principle of the relationship between employers and employees. The same applies to offers of employment, collective agreements, and arbitral awards. Prohibit discrimination against the employee solely because he or she speaks only French or does not have sufficient knowledge of a language other than French in federally regulated private businesses established in Quebec and in other regions with a strong francophone presence in the country. Exemptions or special rules may be provided notably for small businesses, certain sectors, for example, broadcasting, governance activities of First Nations, Inuit and Métis, as well as the conduct of interprovincial or international affairs. With respect <clears throat> to language of service, in federally regulated private businesses in Quebec and in other regions of the country where there is a strong francophone presence, enact a right for consumers of goods and services to be informed and served in French. These new rights with respect to language of work and service only have substantial scope if they are supported by recourse mechanisms. Consequently, a committee of experts will be created and have the dual mandate to develop options and recommendations with respect to possible recourses for workers and consumers and criteria for recognition of regions with a strong francophone presence outside Quebec. Official Languages Commissioner Raymond Teberge called the document very promising. 
I note that the government strategy reflects many of the recommendations I made in 2019 regarding the modernization of the act. The following are a few examples of measures that have particularly caught my attention. Increased recognition of official language minority communities. Enhanced toolbox proposed for the Commissioner of Official Languages promises to support my office's mandate more effectively and ensure improved compliance with the act by federal institutions. The expansion of the scope of the act to include more businesses should ensure that more people can work in the official language of their choice. The appointment of bilingual judges to the Supreme Court of Canada. The explicit reference to Indigenous languages in the modernized act would recognize the importance of these languages in Canadian society and more importantly contribute to our common goal of maintaining, revitalizing and promoting them. The review of the act every 10 years should ensure that it continues to evolve and is able to respond even better to the changing needs of Canadians. Earlier this month, Minister Jody announced the creation of the panel of experts who will make recommendations on possible recourses for workers and consumers and criteria for recognitions of regions with a strong Francophone presence outside Quebec. It will report in May. The area of federally regulated institutions has been a kind of dead zone for language rights. Federally chartered institutions like banks, telecommunication, telecommunication companies, and transportation firms are, have been subject to neither the Official Languages Act nor the Charte de la Langue Française. The NDP, the Bloc Québécois, and now the Conservatives, most recently in Aaron O'Toole's speech to the Conservative Convention last Friday, have called for federally chartered institutions in Quebec to be subject to Bill 101, the Charte de la Langue Française. The white paper doesn't acknowledge doing that, but it looks as if the effect would be largely the same. As we can see through the review I've made of various comments from the Royal Commission on, and various com commissioners have expressed the need for French to be protected and strengthened in Quebec. There's been this element of asymmetry. However, the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that a federal document has formally proposed to enshrine this asymmetry in legislation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you so much, Graham. That was a sweeping review of uh, the policy and the the political context and, and the goals of the Official Languages Act and then taking us right to today uh, in terms of where we are today. So thank you so much for that. I am getting some questions coming in and I'll, as they're coming in, I'll just uh, ask my own question, um, which I threw out to you two weeks ago. <laughs> if you could change, I'm gonna make it harder though. If you could change only one thing about the Official Languages Act, what would it be? Well, I think that I think that part seven has been the uh, has been the problem. I think that that uh, Judge Gascon in tearing it to pieces um, uh, has made it clear that that um, the what was what was uh, amended to grant some powers to the federal government, some obligations to the federal government to take positive measures for the, the growth and development of minority language communities actually has not been an effective tool. And so um, I'm hoping that when they come forward with this, there will be uh, some clarification and uh, policy instruments. When I was commissioner, it had just been introduced. And so I was um, uh, hesitant to call for, um, I was hoping that in the years that would follow, sheer, by sheer practice, there would be developed a whole range of positive measures. And a, a number of federal departments did some very imaginative things in developing uh, positive measures. But I think um, now uh, it's, um, 15 years since, over 16 years since that was first uh, uh, introduced. I think the time is now to, to identify those areas that uh, to go through those criticisms uh, that uh, Judge Gascon made very clear and clarify what this means. I think that Gascon decision does call for some action by somebody um, waiting for that. 
Um, I'm getting a couple of questions about Indigenous languages, actually. I, they're mentioned in the in the Government of Canada's proposal. Um, so one question is, uh, can, can you comment on, on the status of Indigenous languages, either at the moment or within the Government of Canada's proposal or, or generally? Um, well, the, the, um, uh, one of the challenges about, about um, promoting and protecting Indigenous languages is that they are so, there are so many of them. Um, there are some uh, 50, um, by some counts, up to uh, over 100, but 50 major ones. Um, um, only three of those um, have been identified as, as um, uh, having serious chances of survival, um, Cree, uh, Ojibwe, and uh, Inuktitut. Um, Inuktitut is the third largest with some 25,000 Inuktuk speakers, um, and, but it is the, uh, the one with the most, most strength and the greatest likelihood of survival, in part because there is a significant body of uh, communities in Nunavut that are essentially unilingual in Inuktitut speakers. Um, and each of the three territories has made some effort to legislate in the area of language rights. Um, Nunavut has made English, French, and Inuktitut official languages. Um, the uh, Northwest Territories has, I think, nine official languages. And what that means in practice is that in some communities, some of the languages are um, recognized in terms of so delivery of social services. And if someone is coming from a community uh, to Yellowknife and, and wants to hear the debate translated into their language, they have to make a request in advance so that they can do that. Um, in the Yukon, there are 11, I'm, I'm losing track of how many, but, but they do not have an official status the way they do in the Northwest Territories or, or in Nunavut. Uh, there are some elements of protection, but they are, they are quite limited. Now, a few years ago, the federal government passed an Indigenous Languages Act. It has created an um, Indigenous Languages Commission. Um, um, that has a double responsibility, both to promote the use and also to um, preserve an exercise in preservation um, to see how those languages can be can be documented and recorded and preserved so that future generations can look to those speakers of those languages who are now dying out. Um, so there's that double role which doesn't exist for the Commissioner of Official Languages. Um, it, is, it is a challenge that comes in part from the legacy of residential schools, which basically wiped out language use for several generations of Indigenous language speakers. And so um, many Indigenous people now are trying to reclaim the language that their parents or grandparents were forbidden to speak in residential schools. And that's, that is a serious challenge, but a number of people are working very hard to, uh, to do it. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, can you talk a little bit about the kinds and magnitude of funding that's presently provided for um, supporting minority language communities under the current OLA, Official Languages Act, and um, if you, feel so inclined. Uh, how do you think this might change under the proposed Government of Canada white paper? The Official Languages Act itself does not does not deal with funding and the Commissioner of Official Languages has no um, uh, power to 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 grant funding that is that's done by Canadian Heritage. Um, and there are a variety of programs for um, funding um, second language education, for example, um, or minority language education across the provinces. Um, the, um, there are millions of dollars that are spent every year, uh, but given from the federal government to the provinces in support of um, minority language education. One of the problems is one of accountability. Um, the <clears throat> 
provinces do not have to uh, actually demonstrate that all of that money went specifically to um, uh, minority language education. Um, as um, uh, one Minister of Education said candidly to me, when I open a check from the federal government, I don't necessarily read the letter that uh, is attached to it. Um, the, uh, oh. uh, <laughs> and um, so um, when I said that, people grumbled that this was unfair, that of course his, his officials do read the letters, but it, uh, but it does, their provinces are, are um, quite insistent on their exclusive responsibility for education and they can spend the money that they get for education any way they 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 choose and so um, um some of the people who are working in the area of minority language education will joke that um that's a french language basketball and that's a french language gym and uh, uh because the the funds that they thought would be earmarked for explicitly for hiring teachers has gone to other elements of, of educational support Just looking at the questions. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I'll start with a softball. Uh, um, there's a question about Air Canada. This person understands that Air Canada is subject to the Official Languages Act. Um, am I correct in stating that banks are not subject to the act? Um, so <clears throat> explain what, what's going on with that. Okay, yes. Um, well, when when Air Canada was private, Air Canada had been a crown corporation, um, and as a crown corporation, had all of the language obligations of any federal institution. And when it was sold, and the same thing happened with uh, Via Rail, um, one of the conditions of sale was that they would have the same uh, language obligations as a private company that they had had um, with uh, as a as a crown corporation. Now, Air Canada has always complained that this was unfair, that that meant that they had a burden that their competitors didn't have. Um, and there was a an operational challenge when Air Canada absorbed uh, Canadian Airlines, which was a Western based company in which the employees um, were overwhelmingly English speaking. Um, and uh, so Air Canada does have those obligations and the uh, obligations to provide service are quite carefully defined in through regulation as to on those flights where um, the uh, it has been determined by survey that a sufficient number of francophones when the survey took place were found to be using the uh, the, um, the airline. Um, Air Canada has found it very difficult to to live up to the obligations and um, the uh, it is not eligible for federal funding for language training, for example, it spends quite a lot of money training offering training to its employees but because of the nature of the rotation of, of uh, assignments for people it's very difficult for uh, for employees who need language training to to get it. But um, the result is that um, they uh, they have continually had a large number of complaints of people who have been unable to be served in French on uh, Air Canada flights. Um, banks, um, as federally chartered institutions, as I said during my, in my remarks, those private institutions that are federally chartered have been a kind of dead zone. Neither the uh, Bill 101, the Charte de Française applies, nor does the Official Languages Act. And um, there has been quite a lot of pressure, particularly recently, to bring those federally chartered uh, companies under some language regime. And the white paper makes a, uh, makes a proposal. Um, the, one of the things that, I mean, there are certain market realities here. I have, when I was commissioner, I never had any indication that the 
the banks in Quebec um, were unable to serve their customers in French. Um, if you go to a uh, uh, gas station in, um, uh, in Sherbrooke, all of the instructions on the pumps are, are in French. 40% of those federal federally chartered institutions in Quebec have voluntarily lived up to the requirements of the uh, Quebec legislation. Well, I'm going to segue then, Graham, into the question that has been asked repeatedly in the, in the chat and the question function. Um, you ended your presentation um, by describing um, and reading, quoting extensively from, from the proposal of the Government of Canada um, and with respect to the federally regulated businesses. And you talked about how it seems to be introducing, I believe you used the word asymmetry. Um, and uh, I was just wondering if you could comment further on that, particularly with respect to um, the perspective of English speaking Quebecers. Um. It is clearly it is clearly a challenge. Um, there has been, um, uh, as I tried to say through my remarks, from the from the time of the Royal Commission onward, um, through various commissioners, um, a a recognition um, stressing quite often that um, the challenge is the protection of French um, uh, and um, it is was framed by the Royal Commission as a challenge in ensuring that um, Francophone minority communities outside Quebec would have uh, the same status and language use and institutional support of the English community in Quebec. Um, that dynamic has changed um, as uh, the school situation has changed. Um, in 1970, there were almost 300,000 students in the English school system. That is now significantly below 100,000. Um, there are there's a legislation in Quebec to to change the nature of school boards in Quebec, which are important uh, uh, institutions for the for the English community, um, and uh, and similarly, um, there are not the same number of uh, representatives of the traditional English community um, in. Uh, the federal cabinet, as there was 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you had some of the uh, the most powerful members of the federal cabinet were coming from uh, from the the English community in Quebec. Um, there are relatively few members from the English community in Quebec, and there's been a tendency to use the ridings in uh, the English community as safe liberal seats as opposed to representative seats for the English community. That all means a, a challenge for, for um, uh, the English community. Um, and, and it's a challenge that is underlined by the fact that um, the, uh, those English communities off the island of Montreal are um, particularly vulnerable. Thank you. I'm just looking at another question. There's a question about funding for post-secondary education. Um, um, would part seven, hmm, legal hypothetical, would part seven support federal intervention um, when provinces back off of the funding of post-secondary education, and this is a reference particularly to the political tug of war that happened over the uh, Université de l'Ontario Francais, uh, and now uh, U.S. Saint Jean in Edmonton or La Laurentienne in Sudbury or Dawson. Yeah. I will throw the question over to you. I mean, it's a legal hypothetical. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I mean, the the um, certainly well. Let me take a stab at it. Um, 
part seven of the act was used um, with mixed success uh, to challenge uh, uh, CBC Radio Canada in dramatically reducing the um, uh, the amount of um, funding and the programming that was available in um, Windsor. Now um, we took Radio Canada to to, to court one um, at the federal court, lost at the federal court of appeal in a decision by Marc Nadon, as it turns out, who found that there were er procedural errors made by the, uh, at the level of the federal court, which is very hard to appeal to the Supreme Court when the decision is, was procedural rather than uh, substantive. Um, in the long term, it was a success because the the CRTC accepted our arguments that the uh, that that CBC Radio Canada had these obligations, and so required in its license renewal that the CBC restore restore that. It becomes more challenging in the area of um, provincial jurisdiction because Part Five does apply to to. Fed, the federal government, federal institutions, um, and so uh, it becomes now with the Université de l'Ontario Français. Um, it only exists after after Premier Ford um, abolished, abolished it. it. Then it only became, it only became possible to to restore it, reestablish it with uh, after a quite lengthy series of negotiations with the uh, with the federal government and so the federal government is uh, is paying a substantial amount of this shot for creating this institution um, and it's funding that goes on for I think five years Interesting question. Do you feel um, the proposed asymmetry in the in the current government's white paper? Um, do you think that it will strengthen um, the francophone minority communities outside of Quebec? Well, that, oh, and that, if not, why not? Well, that is that is certainly the uh, the clear intention. Um, what is uh, uncertain? Um, I mean, there is a that that white paper in there that what I quoted refers to active offer. Um, federal institutions have find it enormously difficult to uh, to do active offer, which is funnily enough saying hello, bonjour. Um, what what is a legislative requirement for federal institutions has become um, a, uh, a banished phrase uh, as far as the Quebec government is concerned. Um, so given the challenge of within the federal government of meeting some of those uh, those standards, um, I'm not at all sure that that um, private companies, for example, in uh, even in Ottawa, where you do not see a whole lot of bilingual, you know, if you see a bilingual sign on a, on a, a private company in Ottawa, it's almost a guarantee that this is owned and operated by Franco-Ontarians. Um, it uh, you hear a lot more French on the street in Ottawa than you see in the in the uh, in the windows or in the advertisements or uh, and public signs. Uh, that's not true of, of government signs, either either municipal, provincial, or federal, but private sector, not so much. It'll be a challenge. Certainly, it certainly will. Um, um, there's a question here about official bilingualism of, of New Brunswick. And the official bilingualism of, or the official um, unilingualism of Quebec, uh, official bilingualism of Canada. Can you just unpack a little bit? Uh, what's the deal with New Brunswick? How? What? What makes Quebec officially French? What makes New Brunswick officially bilingual? And what makes Canada officially bilingual? 
Okay, well, um, the... Um, sorry, and sorry to interrupt you, Graham. And the other, the other part of the question is, I apologize. Um, how does English in Quebec fit into that? Um, in 1969, a few months before the Official Languages Act was passed, um, New Brunswick introduced uh, its own Official Languages Act, and that Official Languages Act became constitutionalized as part of the, uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So, um, uh, what New Brunswick has done uh, has now constitutionally entrenched its bilingualism uh, in the charter. Um, and that came after almost a decade of um, the rise of um, militancy within the Acadian community and um, uh, a, a Francophone premier um, who, who drove those changes. Um, the Official Languages Act federally um, applies to federal institutions. Um, the uh, Quebec, first of all, in 1974, um, passed uh, the Official Languages Act, making French the official language of Quebec under the uh, Bourassa government. On the recommend, after recommendations of a their own commission of inquiry, which um, called for quite extensive. Um, basically laid the groundwork for, first of all, Bill 22 in 1974, and then Bill 101 in 1977, which basically said that the, the working language of institutions, private and public in Quebec, uh, should be French. Um, the, this does not apply to federal institutions, or has not applied to federal institutions. Uh, we'll see what happens to the, the white paper, which, which um, appears to um, point in a different direction. In terms of other provinces, um, the Ontario government has a um, uh, policy of, of bilingual regions. It passed a, a, a language act, um, Bill 8, some 20, 30 years ago, um, uh, which while it does not declare Ontario to be a bilingual province, it does in reality ensure that people have the right to a trial in French, they can get services in certain designated parts of the province in French or, uh, uh, or English. Um, there are uh, French language policies in the maritime provinces uh, and Manitoba. There is no language policy in Saskatchewan or Alberta. Uh, no, sorry, no, English is declared to be the, the language of government in uh, uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, although there is some provision for protection of French language institutions, and there is no language, uh, provincial language policy in British Columbia, which was up when we uh, the Gascon decision was the final outcome of one of the cases. Previously, that case, an aspect of that case, went to the Supreme Court over whether or not um, the FCBB would be required to provide all of its documents to the court in both languages. And these were this was a, a school board which had all of its documentation in French as a French language school board. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Judge Wagner, uh, now the Chief Justice, wrote a decision in which he said that the, the English law from 1732 had been imported to British Columbia when, with Confederation. And if it had not been explicitly changed, then it still applied. And interestingly enough, the 1732 law, which goes through all of the various details of, of legal proceedings and legal acts and documents um, 
with remarkable precision that need to be in English. That 1732 act was introduced to protect English speaking claimants before the courts so they wouldn't have to deal with lawyers speaking in Latin. And so a, a piece of legislation that was designed to protect citizens has now in British Columbia become a burden for uh, Canadians who thought they had French language rights uh, in an officially bilingual country. So it just goes to show some of the, um, the contradictions that exist in mm -hmm. Canadian language policy. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot to say this before, Graham, but as you were talking about um, the bilingualism of the federally instituted courts, I couldn't help but think I was actually at the Federal Court of Appeal this morning um, and that is a bilingually run court because of, of the Official Languages Act and because of the charter. And as such, um, there, were, there were people pleading in English and French and, simul and the, the panel could understand them all. And there was simultaneous um, interpretation offered for, for the entire public who was watching. And I, I, I always, I, I do love to see that, um, the way that that court is run bilingually. It's, it is, it's very impressive. And the advantage they have is they have what, 44, 47, some, you know, a significant number of uh, federal court judges so that if there is a case, they can, uh, um, it's, it's not difficult for them to put together a panel of, of bilingual judges who mm -hmm. can hear the, the case. One of them. One of the administrative problems that, that this creates, there was a chief justice of the uh, federal court who explained to me that takes much longer for bilingual judges to produce their decisions because they pour over the translation to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the other language version in fact reflects what they wrote, whereas the unilingual judges just sign off on uh, on the translation and send it off un unread and unaltered. That, uh, yeah, just a prayer that it's a good one. And I, I heard from many of my Francophone colleagues that it isn't always. Um, there are definitely lots of challenges still to be to, still faced um, on that regard. Uh, well, I see we have passed uh, our, our end time, but I have one more question from, from, from the chat that I'd like to ask you and then, and then we'll close. Um, it's about the relationship between the language of um, a federal employee, um, the language of work and the language of service. Um, so for example, the question is this, how can service be guaranteed to an English speaking Quebecer if you can't require a francophone employee to be bilingual, what guarantee is there of work and service in English in Quebec? I don't know if this is referring to under federal institutions, I assume. Yeah, yeah. That is actually a, an extremely good question and um, that was litigated. Um, there was a, the case of a federal employee who, um, um, who felt that his right to work in French was being challenged by um, a citizen who insisted on the right to be served in English. And um, this was um, this was litigated, went to, went to court, and uh, certainly came, it came to the Office of the Commissioner of Official Languages. And the right of the citizen prevails over the uh, over the right of the the uh, the employee. Mm. Kevin, am I right in that? Uh, in the federal institution context, yes. <laughs> um, but it's it's. I mean, the other interesting thing about language of work is that, and I've I is it was. I concluded that this was actually quite a radical act because for a federal employee, an enormous amount, and their working life is decided by somebody else, whether it's the the minister, whether it's the deputy, whether it's the uh, ADM, the um, treasury board decides elements, public works decides the size of the workspace, depending on what level the employee is at. There's one area where the employee is able to say in federal bilingual districts, I choose to work in my language of choice. And that then imposes obligations on their superiors. 
and they then have the right to write all of their documents in uh, in French or in English um, to to um, to have their annual evaluation uh, in their language of choice. And so it it uh, when you think about it, it is it is a radically empowering right that is given to employees now. The, di the actual dynamics of the workplace mean that um, an employee who knows that their, their supervisor is actually uncomfortable in their second language um, may choose that it to, to use his, own, his or her own second language rather than embarrass their supervisor by insisting, I have this right and I'm going to, I'm going to insist upon it. Um, but uh, and that's that can happen in both contexts. Both, both. Um, I mean, I've spoken to uh, English-speaking federal public servants who have said that their supervisors want them to use English because they want to improve their own English, and they say, "No, no, no, no this doesn't make sense. I'm perfectly comfortable in French. Let's carry on our relationship in French. And similarly, in Ottawa, lots of Francophone public servants don't want to embarrass their supervisor. Yeah, well, I think, Graham, um, it's been a treat and we could certainly go on for another hour. But uh, unfortunately, I'm getting my, my, my uh, instructions to wrap it up. So um, as I said, it's been a real privilege having you um, on this webinar today. Uh, thank you so much for your generosity of time um, this afternoon. And I'd also like to say a thanks to the QCGN staff um, for organizing and running this web webinar with such great skill. They've been fantastic. And with that, I'll say- I totally agree. Yeah. Back over to you, Kevin. Well, thank you everyone for attending this afternoon's webinar. Uh, you will be receiving an invitation shortly for our next webinar on April 11th on the Charter of the French Language. So see you in two weeks. <laughs>